looks like it's uh, just now 10 o'clock. So um, thank you so much to uh, Joanna Vaughn for uh, sharing your uh, spiritual journey with us today for Forum. Uh, so I guess I'll just uh, turn things over to you. Thank you. And I am looking for what I'm going to be reading. And I'm going to be reading because I'm not particularly comfortable with um, extemporaneous speaking. And I believe there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers and comments at the end. Um, I haven't exactly timed it, but we'll see. Um, so if I'm looking down, it's because I'm reading. Ah, let's start with a little silence, okay? I want to thank the Adult Religious Education Committee for inviting me to present my spiritual autobiography. Can you hear me? Just kind of put your hand up if you can hear me all right. Okay. Um, it's given me the opportunity to review my life. I'm 72 years old now, and this is actually the second time I've done this. I did something similar back at the old meeting house, and it was at that time, pretty much my life story through songs and important people, important songs and important people. And um, I actually wrote that one out also, but I think I gave it to someone who wasn't able to be there. So I don't have it anymore. It would be interesting to me to see what I said back then. As I said, I'm reading because I'm not comfortable speaking extemporaneously and I will include some singing because that's a big part of my spiritual experience, as most of you probably know. I'll start with the first verse of a song whose melody you will recognize probably. And um, it's a sort of an autobiographical song. And this is how it goes. Proudly Protestant, joyfully Jewish, clearly Quaker and Jew through and through. Here's the Christmas tree, there's the menorah. Easter does not make sense without Pesach. Don't hush. Please tell me all your stories and I won't hush. Listen while I tell mine. My parents were intellectuals who met at the University of Chicago in the 1930s. My dad was Jewish and my mom was Presbyterian, but they had pretty much left their religions. And the three of us, when I was little, went to church at the community congregational church in our town in New Jersey. That was in the 1950s for the two years that we lived there before their marriage fell apart. I liked it a lot. We had a little box in the kitchen to collect coins. And at some point our little box went to church with us to join all the other little boxes. And all those coins went to help other people who were less fortunate. There was a Sunday school class in the basement, and I like that too. I still have two little books from that class. Along with my Jewish cousins, we celebrated Christmas with a tree and gifts, and Easter was egg dyeing with my mom, who did fabulous eggs, um, egg hunts and chocolate bunnies. I'm going to digress here to say my mom would use the pinking shears to cut adhesive tape and wrap them around wrap those zigzags around the egg and make the most incredibly careful, beautiful eggs. She was very careful um, and did everything very neatly. She said, I can't paint. And I said, oh, yes, you can. You just stick your brush in the paint and then you put the paint on the paper. <laughs> anyway, she was very encouraging of my art and music. An early religious or spiritual experience took place in our living room where I was listening to the recording of South Pacific and was puzzled by the song, which includes, you've got to be taught before it's too late to hate all the people your relatives hate, etc., etc. 
And I asked my mom, what was this about? Because it was the weirdest song. And she said, there really are people who think that way. And they teach their children to hate. But we don't think that way. And we don't teach you to hate. In fact, they were very careful not to, um, like there were never any um, bad terms for any groups of people used in our house. Um, our household had quite a few Japanese things in it because my dad had been in the military occupation government in Hokkaido, Japan, after the Second World War ended. He had spent most of the war learning Japanese in at Stanford, but he didn't learn it well enough, so he had to have translators. Um, he told me that his job was to make sure all the leftover bombs that were stored in caves around the coast of the island were taken apart so that they couldn't hurt anybody. He also made lifelong friends with his two translators, Mr. Minoru Yoshida and Mr. Inoue. And Mr. Yoshida's daughter, Akiko, and I became pen pals. She had beautiful handwriting and perfect English. He was an English professor. Mr. Inoue was a math professor. Jumping ahead, jumping ahead a mountaintop moment for me came in 2002 when I was one of 200 U.S. K through 12 educators who were selected to participate in something called the Fulbright Memorial Fund program, which was an all expenses paid educational trip to Japan. And I got to meet Akiko and her older sister Keiko in Tokyo. On that same trip, I traveled solo to Hiroshima and visited the Peace Park and Peace Museum, both of which were deeply moving. And I recommend them. I was so pleased when Obama went there. After we moved from New Jersey to New York, due to the divorce, there was no more church or Sunday school. We lived in separate apartment buildings, and I really missed being able to just go outside. And I practiced shuttle diplomacy, where I would go to visit my dad on alternate weekends and never say anything bad about my mom, and then come home and try not to say anything bad about my dad. Um, like the girls in the parent trap, my dream was to get my parents back together. The saving grace of my childhood was Beatrice Harper, our African-American housekeeper. For 10 years, she came to work on Monday mornings and stayed until Friday afternoons. She was Catholic, and on the Monday after Palm Sunday, which is today, of course, she would bring me a little palm cross, which I thought was quite wonderful. She also taught me not to cheat at cards and was part of our family. Sometimes I went home with her on weekends, and once she took me to meet the Mother Superior at the nearby convent, who gave me a St. Christopher medal, which I treasured for years and years, and I have no doubt that she prayed for us all. Another treasure from my childhood, a thing that I could hold, was a gift from my Jewish aunt Louise, a turquoise necklace, um, not, not made of turquoise, but a little enameled heart, turquoise colored, and on the back, the Lord's Prayer was written in tiny, tiny letters, which my eyes were good enough, I could read, and that was how I learned the prayer, and I always wondered if Aunt Louise had noticed that that was there, if it was intentional or accidental. She also gave me a box of oil paints and some canvas boards. And as she was an artist herself, this seemed like a vote of confidence in my own art making. The Lord's Prayer is part of my inner life. My daughter Marina sent me a postcard from Boston where she visited the Christian Science Church. And she said, I think you'd like this, Mama, because they started the Lord's Prayer with Father, Mother, God, not just our Father. And so that's how I say it to myself. And I also say, hallowed be thy names, all thy names, Adonai, Allah, etc. I practice gratitude for my food with our daily bread. And I ask myself, who do I need to forgive and to be delivered from evil and evil to be delivered out of me? I think the Lord's Prayer is like the Jewish high holy days when individuals ask forgiveness of each other between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and then as a body, ask God's forgiveness. 
As a girl in New York City, I was fortunate to go to the Ethical Culture School from second through 10th grades. One of many wonderful things about this progressive school was an ungraded weekly ethics class. Another wonderful thing was the music teacher, Sylvia Kuferstein. She brought us the world through songs. And one of the many songs was the 23rd Psalm. At the end, in this version, it goes, and in my father's heart always my dwelling place. Oh no, and in my heart, let's see, I'll get it, I'll get it right. And in my father's heart always my dwelling place shall be. And in my heart forevermore his dwelling place shall be. This seemed impossible, kind of like a 3D yin yang. How could something, someone so big, be in my heart? And how could I simultaneously be in his heart? This kept me wondering for many, many, many years. My dad taught me to share. Having no siblings, I had to give the last bite of my ice cream cone to Nipper, our dog. He taught me to write letters to my grandparents and to Auntie Janowitz, who turned out was not any relative, but a neighbor of his when he was growing up in Cleveland who lived to be over a hundred. And she wrote back to me in her spidery handwriting. She said, he said, it'll make their day when they get a letter from you. And he told me, go into the kitchen and ask if there's anything you can do to help out. And it turns out that all of these instructions are kind of lifelong. And um, I'm 72 now. I have so many memories, so many memories a couple of significant moments from high school that are related to present time are in an ethics class, a seminar led by Dr. Matthew East Spetter, who had um, numbers tattooed on his forearm because he and his family had been um, in Auschwitz and he was the only one who survived. Um, we were discussing the Holocaust, which was never, ever a topic in my family, I suddenly realized that although I was not considered Jewish by my Jewish friends, because my mother was not Jewish, I realized like in myself, oh, those were my people. It was a big moment in myself. I didn't say anything to anybody, but um, Another day, we had a substitute teacher in ethics whose name was Neil Chasman, and he told a story from his own life. Maybe it was just from the days or week before. He had been walking down Broadway at night and saw a woman across the street who was unsteady on her feet. She was probably drunk. He crossed the street, talked with her, found out that she needed help getting home and got a taxi and took her home put her to bed, locked her into her own apartment, and left. I think that this story was part of the basis of what has become such a large part of my life, which is prison correspondence and visitation. And um, another part was reading a biography of the Quaker um, Elizabeth Fry, who was a prison reformer in England. And then there was also the time when my dad and his best friend, who was a police captain, took me to the precinct station and put me in a cell. And I think they wanted to jail proof me. And they did. I have never been arrested. The cell was gloomy. It was scary. And it was smelly. Also, it seemed like I was there forever. They probably left me there for five minutes. I don't know, maybe two minutes, but it was a long two minutes. It was two minutes. Um, in 11th grade, at my father's insistence, I transferred to Friends Seminary for the last two years of high school. I had been going to 15th Street meeting with him since I was eight or nine. Mostly, as a child, I had just sat by daddy and looked out the windows and watched the trees. But I do remember one message. I even remember like where the person was standing and meeting compared to where we were sitting. Um, and it was a message about a vessel, maybe about being a vessel and about the outside 
matching the inside. I'm not sure at this moment what that message meant, but it was something that I actually remembered from listening. Um, I didn't want to change schools. And I have said many times that a low point in my biography coincided with a low point in the history of Friends Seminary. This was 1965 to 67. And they were transitioning from being an old fashioned school to being in the modern world, which for those of you who were alive then, you remember was sort of a turbulent time. However, in addition to learning how awful school could be, which is useful if you grow up and become a teacher, which I did, um, I made a lifelong friend and took a really excellent comparative religion class, learning about Taoism, Buddhism, Islam, and more familiar religions and their various beliefs and practices. I sang in the choir at St. George's Episcopal Church across the street where my new friend's dad was the organist and assiduously studied the architecture during sermons because I was afraid that if I listened, they might get me and I didn't want them to get me. At the time I was sort of anti um, and scornful about religious beliefs. When I should have been doing homework, I was drawing. I had a, a practice of doing homework, drawing, homework, drawing, homework, drawing, homework, drawing, homework, but I never really got to the last one because drawing always got bigger, right? And I didn't have a timer. Um, when I should have been reading about colleges, I was reading the United Realty and Strout Realty farm catalogs. I wanted to live on a farm, not in a 15th floor apartment in New York City. At the end of high school, my mom and I were distant. My dad was going through a second divorce, and so they were pretty unavailable. And I was recovering from surgery on my left femur. I went to the University of Chicago, which was sort of the family school, and I made two more lifelong friends there and met my first husband. Some of you knew John Peterson. Coming from Kansas, he had poured over the same farm realty catalogs. And we both wanted to get out of the city. So after two years in Chicago, we left and went to Ohio, where he went to Antioch and I went to the woods, literally. I went tromping around in Glen Helen. If you've ever been in Yellow Springs or if you ever go, Glen Helen is wonderful, just wonderful. And I worked at the cooperative nursery school and took a class in Japanese brush painting. At the bookstore, a little book fell off the shelf into my hands, which was called Early Childhood Education and the Waldorf School Plan by Elizabeth Grunelius. I want to say at one point, many years later, I actually met Elizabeth Grunelius and was able to thank her for making this wonderful little book. I really loved what I read. At some point during that first semester, we learned about a 40 acre organic farm whose owner needed to sell half the farm. She wanted to stay, but she needed somebody to buy half of it because her stepson wanted money, not farmland, and her husband had died without a will. We went to visit and I fell in love with the barn, with the frozen ground, and I bought the undivided half interest. We moved there along with five students from University of Dayton who were all Catholic. We were all hippies and lived communally for about a year. The contrast between New York City and Chicago and the farm was huge. Of course, I had to get over being afraid of the dark. It was really dark out at night, you know, no street lights. And um, during the time that we lived there, from 1970 to 1978, Osro Everding, who was a natural foods advocate and a neighbor about my age, um, took me to meet Hans and Ingrid Buchinger, who lived an hour west in Richmond, Indiana. Hans was there because he taught at Earlham. They were Quakers and anthroposophists, and she became a life mentor. I drove to their house as a weekly pilgrimage for about a year until they went back to Germany. And after milking the goats, making and eating a vegetarian supper and um, cleaning up after supper, 
we'd take turns reading out loud from a book by an anthroposophical author, The Year and Its Seasons by Eleanor C. Mary. And the idea kind of got into my mind that maybe there was some meaning, even purpose in the universe after all. Living in rural Ohio, I met people and learned things that they don't teach in college. I learned that people who had only been through fifth grade and maybe didn't always spell correctly were every bit as intelligent and valuable as I. I also took my first class in re-evaluation counseling or RC, which I've continued to practice to this day. Two key ideas from RC and not unique to RC are, I am just a human being, no better than and no worse than any other human being and we are all in this together. I so wanted to be closer to God and went through the initiation for transcendental meditation. During that, I saw with my eyes closed the most wonderful, wonderful, dazzling scene. Indescribable, but very beautiful. Um, I later heard from my grandmother that she had had a similar experience when she lived on the mountaintop in Washington State, which was their homestead until they lost their homestead. Um, but she'd had a similar visionary experience. Um, so on the farm in the wintertime, I was walking the fields and asking, you know, talking to God, asking for some sign. I didn't receive any noticeable response. But given what seemed to be a choice between a world in which there was no God and no meaning or purpose and a world in which there was God and meaning and purpose, I chose to believe in the latter. And I still so choose. That was 1970 something. Since then, two children, Marina and Jesse, Waldorf teacher training, moving here to teach at the Austin Waldorf School. And Helen Steele, who was the retired Waldorf school, who was mentoring the fledgling school at the time, was dying of cancer. We took turns spending nights with her at Seton Hospital. And when I took my turn, I went in and she was just, you know, really out of it. She was drugged and the bed clothes were all in disarray. And I asked God if I could take some of her pain. I didn't receive any pain. But I did have a vision of angels ascending and descending from her bed. Having grown up in an apartment building, it looked more like an elevator shaft than Jacob's Ladder. But I figure it was probably a similar, similar vision. My mom came to Austin and she wanted to move here, but she died here. I divorced, I became a single mom, and with encouragement from Margaret Hoffman, became a member of the Friends Meeting with my kids. At a Waldorf Teachers Conference in Toronto, I had a powerful experience during a conversation with another teacher. We're just standing there, surrounded by other people having conversations, and all of a sudden, there was a whoosh, like that whoosh when you send an email. And I found myself in the tomb like the tomb, Jesus's tomb. It was empty. The stone had been rolled away. And then whoosh, I was back standing facing her. And I told her about it. And we were both kind of astonished. It was a very real experience. And to this day, she calls me on, around Easter time because she remembers that moment as well. Then after 11 years of teaching, I had burnout. There was no more water. You turn on the faucet and there wasn't even a drip. That led me to Pendle Hill where I was so lucky to get a scholarship, a teacher scholarship. And I spent the school year at Pendle Hill, the Quaker Study Center near Philadelphia. There was a woman rabbi there who she didn't live on the campus, but she was in Philadelphia. What was her name? Marsha Prager. And she co-taught a class with Rebecca Mays. And the teaching that Marsha Prager gave us about the name of God, Y-H-W-H, -H, she said, try and say that. What does that sound like? 
And she said it was the sound of every creature who breathes. So that every creature who breathes says or makes the sound of the name of God each time they inhale and exhale. This, the way that she presented it was tremendously moving to me. I just can't tell you how excited I was by this. I led a community Seder at Pendle Hill. And when I came back to Austin, I married Larry Vaughn under the care of the meeting. My kids grew up, they went off to college and Larry and I have been living in the same house here together, composting and gardening and providing hospitality since 1993. And I just touched something and lost what I'm reading from, hold on. So here we are scrolling down. Okay. Um, okay. When I came back to Austin, I didn't have a job and I got a job teaching art in AISD, which I did for 17 years. And it was really good. I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, I also earned an MED at UT during that time. And through the friends meeting, became active in the anti-death penalty arena. Since retirement 10 years ago, I've joined the Austin Threshold Choir, which sings at Hospice Austin's Christopher House. And that turned out to be like even better than I had anticipated. I love singing. Singing is really meaningful. The songs, the content of the songs is really meaningful. The um, making the harmony together is important, um, fulfilling, and we're doing good work for the people who are in the process of dying. And we also, I think to everybody's surprise and delight, get each other. So the relationships um, are very strong among us, which is also true about the relationships of between us, those who travel to death row. Um, so at Christopher House, that happens to be where Margaret Hoffman died and where Jude Filler died. And they both died in the same room, some years apart. I became very interested in end of life matters. And I'm very glad I got to be with my mom right after she died and with my, mom, my dad before, during, and after his death. Um, Larry and I went to a Dia de los Muertos display at Mexicarte years ago, and they had this saying in Spanish, el amor es más fuerte que la muerte, which means love is stronger than death. And I did learn that through the death of my parents. Birth being at the other end, I do want to conclude with my three grandchildren, Cassius Walker, who's 10 and lives in Austin, Inez Peterson, who's nine and lives in Glendale, California, and her little brother, Joao Peterson, who is not yet one and lives also in Glendale. My goal is to be able to walk into their high school graduations, and that motivates me to try and keep healthy. I'm going to end with this poem that I happen to have memorized from the Lord of the Rings, or maybe it's from The Hobbit, and it goes, the road goes ever on and on, down from the door where it began. Now far ahead, the road has gone, and I must follow, if I can, pursuing it with eager feet until it joins some larger way where many paths and errands meet, and whither then, I cannot say, but it's an ongoing journey. And that's pretty much all I have to say. I have no idea what time it is. I probably talked fast and it's probably not very late. So anybody who wants to ask or comment, feel free. Uh oh, 30 minutes of silence. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I loved the way you gave examples and, you know, really shared little events and little scenes. It was really wonderful. Thanks, Jean. 
I remember, and I've told you this before, I remember you're standing up in meeting and saying, I choose joy. <laughs> yeah. I learned some things too about you. I'm a good goat milker. I know. I forgot about the Ohio farm part. <laughs> That's great. Just push anything? No, you can just speak. Maybe you said, but what do the letters RC stand for? Re-evaluation counseling. Thank you. It's peer counseling, Mary. I liked everything. Thank you. Um, I especially liked how you used the Lord's Prayer in a personal way, in an evaluative way, um, in, in your prayers. Uh, that's really meaningful to me. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about Francis Hole? I know he was at Pendle Hill when you were there, and he was part of my childhood, and I'd love to hear your experiences with him. Okay. Francis Hole was just a delightful human being who um, was a retired soil scientist from the University of Wisconsin, and he also played violin. And he had a series of presentations which were about the history of the formation of the planet um, from a soil science point of view and illustrated, if you will, with music. So he played the sound of clay and it was, I think Mozart, it was very beautiful. And then he played gravel and I'm, I'm not sure what sequence because I don't know geology that well, but, um, and he told stories and the, the story that I remember was that God was walking on the created rocky, hard planet and talking to the granite and the granite was very proud of being very hard and strong. And <laughs> God said, could you perhaps loosen up a little bit because I have this plan and the plan is for something called plants and animals and people, but it totally depended upon soil and soil comes from rocks that have crumbled. Would you be willing to crumble a little bit to help this plan go forward? And the granite said, yes. <laughs> I, I really adored this man, and I must have arranged for him to give his presentation at a public school in Philadelphia and took him there. And we got there with the violin and were taken into the teacher's lounge. And they had, of course, a coffee machine in the teacher's lounge. And I offered him a cup of coffee. And he said he had never had a cup of coffee in his life. I think I had never met a human that had never had a cup of coffee in their life. It's like, whoa. <laughs> anyway. I remember he wouldn't swat mosquitoes either. Really? Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't kill a mosquito. So what if a mosquito landed on him and was sucking his blood? I don't quite remember. Probably just brushed it off. But I remember <laughs> as a young person being like, whoa, really? That's interesting. 
<laughs> and that's a respect for life. <laughs> really? Yeah, he would, he would be on my list of favorite people I have known. Although I didn't know him as well as you did. Joanna, thank you so much. It's just wonderful to hear your story from beginning to end. Uh, so many wonderful things in it. Um, I keep thinking about your time in Ohio in the farm uh, and your desire not to be in a 15th floor apartment, maybe be out of the city. But now you're back in the city. Is there anything about that farm life that you miss or do you feel that you've kind of brought the two things together? here in Austin, the way you live? Good question. Um, it's actually a, a pretty big regret that I sold the farm for money. Um, it's not organic anymore. So I feel like I really let Mother Earth down. Um, there were 27 acres of organic soil under cultivation and seven acres of woods and um, whatever the addition is, there was barn and two houses. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I still dream about it and I'm committed to being here because my daughter lives here and my grandson lives here. And I assume maybe incorrectly, but we'll see that they will stay until he finishes high school and he's in fifth grade. Mm. I would love to live a little farther away from the from the um, highway, but um, it is what it is, and um, it's kind of what you focus on. Um, yeah, I mean, I learned so many wonderful things, and I didn't stay, and here I am. Uh, Joanna, uh, you've taught a lot and teaching means a lot to you. What advice would you give someone who is soon to have a child for uh, child rearing? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Yesterday I taught a class at Laguna Gloria, nine to 11 year olds and I tell you, I think I'm getting too old for this. Um, the, one of the girls, this never happened before. I mean, seriously, this has never happened before. One of the girls just went off by herself. And boy, boy, was that ever unnerving. Um, fortunately, she was going off by herself to go back to the classroom while we were on a walk. But, um, and that was only part of it. You know, there was like, there was another incident, another incident, all in three hours, you know, I'm like, oh man, I'm too old for this. Um, I guess, boy, oh boy, I feel so not qualified to answer this question, even though, you know, one would hope that at this age and with my experience, I would be qualified. Um, take good care of yourself stay healthy physically and emotionally and um, let them cry, but give them attention so they're not crying alone. Um, I, I would strongly discourage any new parent from letting the child cry alone and cry himself or herself to sleep because I think that results in the kid giving up on the parent. And... Um, so does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. I, I also maybe just to expect the challenges because they're gonna be challenges and um, appreciate the moments because it goes poof. <laughs> so take lots of pictures, take notes. 
sing lots of songs. <laughs> Although I used to embarrass my kids by singing in places like the post office or the grocery <laughs> store. Like, oh, mama. <laughs> they survived. I think we could just stop and what do you say, James? Oh, oh, sounds like there might be another question. Um, yeah, um, Joanna, could you talk about the uh, time that you and John Peterson spent traveling around the United States and how that has affected your spiritual growth? Um, we did. We spent 11 months living in a travel trailer, starting in Ohio. Imagine the map going to the East Coast, down to the very tip of Florida, up the coast, Gulf Coast of Florida, to Texas for the first time, and then New Mexico, and Arizona, and California, and up the West Coast, and then we didn't drive to Alaska, we actually flew. And um, then we had left the trailer in Seattle. We went across Canada, the southern part of Canada, and came back into the United States in Minnesota and ended up about five hours north of where we started in Detroit, which is where I went to Waldorf teacher training. And um, what, what, um, certainly, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure about how it contributed to my spiritual growth. I certainly learned a lot about the United States and birds and plants and different kinds of food. I met grits. I never had met grits before <laughs> um, and uh, crawfish. Um, I, I guess appreciation for nature. John was really into birding at that point and we were kind of on his coattails with binoculars and learning a little bit from him. So, you know, learning about nature and that certainly is part of everybody's spiritual life. So thanks, Terry, for asking the question. Definitely got me outside my comfort zone. Uh, so I'm... Uh, planning to be married under the care of the meeting uh, later this year. And I was just wondering what your experience of being married under the care of Friends Meeting of Austin was like. That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> me personally, the, the clearness committee was very, very good and supportive to us, but not so good or supportive to my kids um, who were teenagers and there really wasn't any outreach. That's not relevant to your situation. Um, being married under the care of the meeting a year later, one of the people on the committee, Jane Leslie reached out to us and said, so how's it going being married? And <laughs> that was pretty much it as far as ongoing care from the meeting for our marriage. And I do have kind of a gripe about that, not just for me personally, but if you're gonna say you're being married under the care of the meeting, does the care of the meeting stop after you get married? I don't know, you know. So I brought that up a long time ago and there was a, I think it was an FGC couple who came and did some kind of couple enrichment thing here, but 
um, for whatever reason, Larry and I didn't participate. I don't know if we were typically slow to respond to the invitation to reserve a space and there weren't more spaces. I don't remember, but um, you know, marriage is hard. <laughs> I mean, it is hard. It's good, but it's hard. So just like with the question about children, expect the challenges. Um, being married under the care of the meeting. I mean, if I were going to do it again, I think I would literally schedule um, like another meeting of the committee, the clearness committee for some specific time in the future, maybe six months, maybe a year, whatever. Seriously, I would like to see marriage under the care of the meeting extend beyond the act of getting married. Okay. My care and counsel. <laughs> Ackles are getting up. Of, a few years ago, we, we considered this question in care and counsel, and we sent out a questionnaire to all the people who had been married under the care of the meeting and asked what we could be doing for them. And we got one reply from one of the people who was on care and counsel. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of let that drop. But, but we should maybe bring this up to the meeting in general or something. Because I think it's a really good question. What should the care of the meeting mean after people are married? Anyway, sorry. <laughs> no, no apology necessary. Um, I don't remember receiving the questionnaire. And um, if it was an email? No, it was a letter. Really? A physical letter. Wow. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't reply. <laughs> That's probably enough, don't you think? Great. Yeah, we're just about at 10 minutes out. So anyway, Joanna, I, I just, I love hearing this, your story so much. Um, and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.